The Lord be with you. You're reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. At that time, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became glistening intensely white as no fuller on it could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three boots, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man should have risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions for today. Question number one. What is the relationship, if any, between the sacrifice of Isaac that we read about in the book of Genesis and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary? Is there a relationship? What is the relationship? Question two. In our second reading from Romans 8, verse 31 to 34, St. Paul establishes the foundation of our faith in God. What is this foundation? Question three. How is today's second reading a source of consolation for Christians in adversity? And question four. As we all watch the plight of poor Nigerians worsening by the day. On social media, we are seeing such kind of things we used to hear about Somalia, about Venezuela, kind of things we used to hear about failed societies, failed countries, where people are scrambling for bread, bread thrown onto the bare floor, and people are scrambling for it. Um, the level of distress is such that in my lifetime, I have never seen, and many have never seen. As we watch the plight of poor Nigerians, worsening by the day, what are you doing in God's name to lessen the pains of people around you and to give hope to those that are more distressed than you? I know you are distressed, right? But there are people more distressed than you. What are you doing to lessen the body of those that are more distressed than you? Yes, Emmanuel. Sorry to Jesus. Answers to question one. The relationship between the sacrifice of Isaac and that of Jesus. Isaac and Jesus were both begotten, they were beloved sons of their fathers. Isaac and Jesus are beloved sons of their father, yes. Isaac spent, sorry, Abraham spent 100 years waiting for Isaac. And then the world spent a lot of time waiting for Jesus to come. And then when Isaac finally came, God now sent him, Abraham, a test to go and sacrifice Isaac on the mountain to test his faith, trust, and obedience. And he also sent Jesus through the Garden of Gethsemane to test, to test whether he'll be ready for the plight out they are waiting. Uh, Jesus' own was not just test, though. He, he, he actually, Pafuka on the cross. <laughs> it was not just test. Abraham's own, he passed test, so he was left, his son was left for him. 
That of Jesus, he died over. But the reward for his test, because it was actually a test in the sense that the reward was resurrection from the okay, dead. Okay, the reward is resurrection. Give him a round of applause. Okay. Okay, Rahaji. Glory to God forevermore. Amen. I would like to attempt question three. Yes. How is today's second reading a source of consolation for Christians? I think the first thing is that God is for us. He's not against us. Oftentimes, people go through adversity and they feel like God has abandoned them. But this scripture lets us know that God is for us. He's not against us. Because if he was able to give his son, then there's nothing he can withhold from us. If God can give his son for us, then there is nothing he can withhold for us. From us. Uh, but what, what if we are looking for a better country and the thing is getting worse? Is God still for us? Yes. And the other thing is that God does not condemn us because Christ is with him pleading our cause. So we don't need to continually live in fear, in guilt, and in doubt. We can freely assess God. We can freely go to him and we'll certainly find satisfaction if we trust in him continually. But that still does not, when people are in great adversity, when people lose, when you have a family that somebody, they have lost all the relations, Remaining only the person living. It's a serious adversity. Yes. So that one is not that one is not just a test. The adversity is there. Yes. So how how would you console the person with today's reading? For me, the first thing is that if God is for you, what can be against you? No, what is against you is that all your relations, all your, your family members are dead. <laughs> And you know, Father, it goes on in that scripture to say that to say that in all things we are more than conquerors through Him that loves us. So there is victory at the end. It may look like everything is dark and failing, but because we have Jesus, we have the love, and we have God for us, everything will still work out for good. Everything will still work out. But the person says, "Look, the bandits came and killed my all, everybody. How is it going to work out?" Well, in the moment, it wouldn't look like everything is okay. But there is a God who is working out every circumstance. There's something that I am looking for. And that is to say that the logic of that passage is not just a disworldly logic. Yes. That's the point. And if you do not put in that logic, it, it doesn't make sense to the suffering person. One of the key things, you know, I keep saying here that Christianity makes suffering sufferable. Okay. Christianity makes suffering sufferable. And that there is no other religion that can actually... Christian, Christians are supposed to be experts in suffering. Not that we love suffering, but we are experts in suffering because of Jesus' death on the cross and his eventual resurrection. So, all Christian suffering becomes sufferable. Aha. And it is in the light of the resurrection. It is in the light of the new life that will come. And if you don't emphasize that, then the person is stuck. And that's why we keep saying that if what you are looking for, God for, are uh, my child, my, uh, my contract, this, if that is for the reason for which you are looking for God, you will be disappointed because at some point, you won't have what you want. Um, I was, looking, I was, I was, I was uh, listening to Bishop Barron's uh, uh, homily for today, and he says that what the problem is that people are looking for the God of gifts. But they are not looking for, no, they, they are looking for the gifts of God. They are not looking for the God of oh, gifts. Yeah. That's the problem. And if you are in church because of what God can give, one day you'll be disappointed. If you do not look for God himself because he is worth worshipping, even when you are in pain, in adversity. And because you have God, what St. Paul means there is that if I have God, I have everything. Do you understand? If I have God, you can take every other thing from me. If I have God, I have everything. But do my brothers and sisters believe that? <laughs> eh? Do my brothers and sisters believe that? That if I have God, I have everything. That you can take everything away. We have some choruses like that, right? You can take everything away as long as I have God. But our people don't say it from the depth of their heart. Which is why we run from one powerful man of God to the other. I mean, um, 
uh, God's time. This was the issue yesterday, right? Uh -huh. One of your people sent me whatever and said, ah, how can you be talking like this? People run from one man of God to the other because as I keep saying that the Bishop Honor said that in the Igbo land, if your chi does not, uh -huh, if your chi does not do your bidding, you will carry the wooden symbols of your chi, you break it and use it for firewood, bloody fool, and go for another chi. <laughs> and this is where our people are. Because we are looking for, we are in church, we are in prayer houses, we are in shrines for what we want. But Christianity says, yet thy will be done. We are supposed to be in church for what God wants for us. And what God wants for us does not always coincide with what we want. Give her a round of applause. Yes, uh, Val. May God Almighty be glorified eternally. Amen. Amen. Father, may I attempt question number two? Yes. The foundation is reassurance of God's co continuous presence in our lives. No, there, there's, there's a phrase there. I'll, there's a phrase there, and it's very clear. It's, it's close to what you're saying, but there's, it's very clear. If God is for us, who is will be against us. Yes. And he, he did not spare his own son. They gave him up for all. Try harder. <laughs> <laughs> will he not give us all things with him? Actually, it is the last phrase, it's the last verse. Who, sh who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Is it Jesus who died? Yes. The foundation is God's faithfulness and love. Do you understand? All this you are saying is expressing God's love. You are describing it. But you are describing God's love. It is God's love and faithfulness that made him not to um, withhold his son. It is God's love and faithfulness that made him to allow his son to die on the cross and blah, blah, blah. So it is the foundation for our faith in God is his love. Not our love. Do you understand? Yeah. It's his love. We don't believe in God because we love him. We love God. We believe in God because he loves, loves, loves us. us. And, and if you take it, um, unite that with Romans chapter 5 verse 8. What shows God's love is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. That is why we believe in God. How many of us will share the applause? Me and... Me and Val share the applause. Let me and Val share the applause. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Azubike. Father, I want to attempt question four. Yes. As we watch the plight of poor Nigerians, not just poor Nigerians, Father, it's touching almost everybody. And it is poor. Uh, uh. It's touching everybody, but it's touching the poor more. Let me tell you, my friend Mojid, you know our staff, Mojid. Yeah. Mojid told Father Richard the first day, he said <clears throat> that some of us have decided to stop begging. Because when we see the crowd of people that we are better than begging, we swallow our need and don't beg. I, do you get the point? Say some of us have stopped begging. Because when we look at the horde of people that we are better than, that are begging, we, we set aside our, <laughs> our need. So, as you became, there so, are so, a lot of people that you are better than. So, that, that, that's, so, so I know you yeah. have problem, but you are a big man. He so, <laughs> says, what am I doing? And, it, and this is personal. Uh, and lately, as I've started praying for politicians of all hues, the good ones, and the terrible ones we all know. We all know them. I pray for them because they brought this darkness on us. Not just today, it started many years ago. I'm praying for politicians. Uh, pray if for you, Nigerians too. Yes. Praying for, pray for idiot Nigerians. Yeah, and the idiot because Ni you remember our idiot homily. Pray for our idiot Nigerians who insist on my brother. Now my brother, I go vote. So it is not just pray for, pray for those who install 
People that they know are crooked. They go ahead and install them because of their selfish interest. You need to pray. Even that one needs more fasting. That one needs serious fasting. I, I, you know, they, I used to consider it an insult when they say that a people get the kind of leadership they deserve. It's an insult to say a people get the kind of leadership they deserve. But in recent times, I said, maybe there is some truth to it. Because if people continue in idiocy, then one of the idiots will become their leader. And they, they indeed continue in their idiocy. I talk to a lot of people, Father, you know, I run a pharmacy. Yes. And I speak to a lot of people. And I see that a group, a group, we are not learning any lessons. We are not. No, no, no. The, the next few months, we shall learn lessons. I hope, <laughs> I hope, I hope. I ask I hope. for the next few months, we I shall hope. learn lessons. Because the way we are going now, the way we are going now, me, I don't know how it will be by this time next year. So, lessons will be learned. Lessons must be learned because, I mean, Father, for me, leadership is not about influence. It's the popular saying that leadership is about influence. No. For me, leadership is about sacrifice. As we saw in all the readings today from Abraham sacrifice, yes. and all. It was sacrifice. Our leaders are not sacrificing. They are not. They are not sacrificing. For me as a person, what am I doing? You have told us you are praying for leaders, yes? Yes. And I say you should add, pray also for idiots. I'm, I'm praying for idiots. And there are many idiots, Father. <laughs> there are just too many idiots. What am I doing? It is terrible that, Father, in the pharmacies, people, if you don't know it, I spoke in this church sometimes ago about the cost of medicine. I am frightened. I am frightened. So what I've done is that if a drug is inside the pharmacy, we sell at the old price, notwithstanding the changes. I'll give an example. Amaril for the diabetics. Amaril for diabetics. In my shop, the pharmacy, the cost for now, the ones in the stock, is about 9500 for a pack of 30 tablets. We ordered from the wholesalers just yesterday. We bought 19000 your popular quatem, 40 for malaria. For 80 by 480 for malaria by 6. The one in my pharmacy as we speak yesterday was 3,000 per pack. We ordered a fresh one. We bought them at 5,000. So for me, my own sacrifice is that, okay, you said I'm a big man. I can bear, because I can also, I know friends who have said what they do. It's to change prices. No, that's to, what they are doing. To yeah. continue to change prices. And that's what is happening. If you go to the market, people are changing prices. Again, Father, is that we must begin to touch people. We must begin to and, touch. And that is what you are saying, thank you for the example. What you are saying is that poor people, oppressed people, must have mercy on other poor people. Yeah. Because some people, some colleagues of yours, or some uh, marketers, have seen this as the time to make a lot of money. That's why many supermarkets, many places, they no longer place any price. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what they bought the product for. They jack it up. And that is, that is um, inordinate profit. It's in, people are suffering. You are making it harder. You bought something for 3000 because it's today 9000 You sell it for $9,000. That's, that's wicked. They say, oh, I need to sell it so, so that I have to have money to buy more. But So you keep getting richer and the people get, keep getting poorer. So let us, let, it's important you give that uh, uh, example. We are dying. If you bought it for 3000 and you want to sell it for 4000 that is okay. When you now go and buy for 10000 you can now sell it for 12000 But don't sell the one you bought for 3000 for 12000 It's unjust profit. And people do that and go to church to do Thanksgiving. It's unjust profit. So thank you for that example. So, so for, for me, my staff, what I do now, I mean, the salaries are mega. No, not, salaries have been made. They're not salaries. No I, I mean, I reflect and I say, oh my God, why do I pay people this? But I can't do more than what I'm paying. So what I do now is that at intervals, we just, whatever I have, we share. We share. 
Look, take this for transport. And, and other people should do the same. So Whatever if, you have from salaries, time to time, you share. If you look at the salaries, you might not. I mean, try and ask your staff who lives somewhere how much he pays to get to work. Because what it does is that nobody is honest again. If we are not careful, everybody is stealing. You have staff, they steal now. If, so I, I think it's going down to what we can all begin to do. Because... The leaders have been, if you can grab, snatch, and run, what else would you do? Thank you. Give me a round of applause. Yes. <laughs> grab, snatch, and run the fortunes of the people and leave the people stranded. I would like to add a personal perspective to number four question. Yes. Um, the plight of poor Nigerians. You made reference to the fact that people are picking bread on the floor and all that. My experience during the war in Biafra, I was not too old, I was just a young person, but old enough to see that there wasn't even bread on the floor to be picked. It was so horrible. Yet, People survived at the end. So you think so, we shall survive this? Yes, we shall survive it. So when I talk to people, I talk to them that the person speaking to you was once in a, an environment where, Father, you, you see, we almost ate cockroach in order to... Oh, Pat is confirming. We ate. <laughs> so you are, so you are standing now. Cockroach is facing you. <laughs> okay. But. The one that I can be sure. Don't maybe, worry. It is a celebrity. No, uh, cockroach, no, no. cockroach is special diet in China. Maybe so Pat ate cockroach. <laughs> I am sure of lizard. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, what I'm saying is that I talk to them and I tell them that this too shall come to pass. So you encourage people? Yes, I encourage. And then for us here in Luxterra, I'd like to make a suggestion. I don't know how it will work out. But I think all of us here, we are not in this group. A group that, even if we are, is very, very do you, do you know our 53 people who depend, who come for food every, every month? Yes, that's what I'm saying. In addition to what we are doing, we personally should take up a program where we feed somebody in our house. Okay, apart from what we do together. What we do personally in our house. We get, whether I'm a guard, whether somebody, at least once a day, we can afford to do it in this chapel. Every day, you get somebody, in addition to what you are eating, you get somebody in your neighborhood to feed that person. That's a good suggestion. A and that is not just for us here. That is for everyone listening to us or watching us. Look for somebody nearby you to support with a, a meal a day. If you are able to eat two meals, look for somebody to support. And then you can, you can occasionally do O one O so that you can exactly. help somebody. While we are in this tunnel, before we are liberated from this tunnel. All right. Yes, Pat. Sorry, Father, I want to emphasize hope. I just hope. thought I should give that. Uh -huh. So coming from him, yes. yes. Um, sacrifice and abundance, you can see it in question one. The sacrifice of Isaac and the opening of the world to Abraham, who had literally lost hope. The sacrifice of Calvary came that we may have life and have it to the full. John 10.10. 10. I think that as we go through this season, as we sacrifice, let hope be there that what lies in front is a greater, greater... So we take power. this as a period eaten by the locust, right? Yes. 
and that after the years eaten by the locusts, there will be a period of abundance. In Jesus' name. Amen. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. In Jesus, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. Amen. The extraordinary fate of Abraham. The account of the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22 shows that Abraham's faith in God was complete, right? His faith, his trust, Abraham's trust in God was absolute. His submission was total. His obedience was unqualified. Abraham had faith in God. And when he was called to act, you remember St. James says, faith without works is dead. Abraham said he has faith in God. But when he was called to act on this faith, he did not fail. He passed the test. He was prepared to offer what was most precious to him, his only son Isaac, in a burnt offering. You see, God doesn't ask us for sacrifice that, of something that is not precious to us. That's, that's, that's the, the style of God. God doesn't ask us to sacrifice a, some periphery of ourselves. He wants to sacrifice the core at the heart of our being. That's what he wants. That's why we say that Jesus either has the whole of you or none of you. You know? This is faith at work. For faith without works is dead. James chapter 2. Abraham has given us an example of what the Lord requires of his children. What is it? One, two, three, Four, five, and six. We celebrate in Lent the mysterious love of God who did not with um, Val. That's it. That's, that's the foundation. We celebrate the mysterious love of God who did not withhold his only son. He offered his only son in sacrifice for us while we were yet sinners. John chapter 3 verse 16, Romans chapter 5 verse 8, Romans chapter 8 verse 32. What shows God's love for us is that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. We didn't merit it. Just as Abraham proved his faith by offering his son Isaac, God proved his love for us by letting his son go through the cross of Calvary. God's saving work comes to us out of his immense love. What he demands in exchange for his divine love is our own total surrender. So, God's own obligation that he has imposed on himself is to love us, right? The obligation that we have is to submit and surrender to him. Just as Abraham's faith in God inspired his entire life, our firm faith in the power of God, our deep conviction of God's love, our strong belief in the victory of life over death and good over evil should inspire our entire life and the choices we make in life daily. The event of the transfiguration, which is what we read in the gospel, Mark chapter 9, verse 2 to 10, is set on Jesus' road to Jerusalem. And if you understand what that means, Jesus had now completed his work and he was going to Jerusalem where he will suffer, where he will be rejected, where he will be crucified, where he will die. And he is going to face the fate of all the prophets before him. He was on his way to a city where he will be rejected, condemned, tortured, and crucified. He will naturally recoil at such a fate. Any human being will recoil at such a fate. And Jesus was fully man and fully God. Yet, he was committed to his father's will. And therefore, he was determined to go. On their way, he went up a high mountain, taking with him Peter, James, and John. He went there to reflect 
and to pray over the adversity that was to follow, that was soon to follow. He went up the mountain to seek the face of the Father, to find encouragement and support, the kind of encouragement and support and hope that we are talking about, to obtain strength for the journey. And as he prayed, he had a vision. He had a marvelous experience. He was transfigured. His appearance changed completely. His face shone like the light. His clothes became dazzlingly white, like no bleacher can make it. Something strange happened. Moses and Elijah that had died hundreds of years before, they appeared. And then something, another strange thing happened. A voice of the Father was heard from heaven saying, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Mark 9, 7. It was a most glorious moment for the disciples. They had never seen anything like that. They were confounded, mesmerized. The event was beyond description. Then Peter requested that they remain there. It was too good for them to leave that place. He said, let's remain here. Let me, I'm a tent maker. I can make tents. Let me make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Three tents praising the glory of God. Of course, the Bible says he did not know what he was saying. The transfiguration was a rare event at which the veil that separates the invisible from the invisible, the veil that separates the present from the future was removed. Do you get that point? In that moment, there was no longer a difference between today and tomorrow, between the present the present Jesus and the Jesus that will be glorified. They were able to see in that moment the Jesus that will be glorified. It was an epiphany, meaning God showed himself. Now, something similar happened to Jesus at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. You remember? The Spirit of the Lord descended upon him and a voice was heard from heaven saying almost the same thing. This is my beloved son, my favor rest and him, in one translation, it says, listen to him. Jesus, for Jesus, the transfiguration was a moment of profound encounter with God. When the spirit exploded with brilliance on Jesus, when he heard a rare, had a rare glimpse of God's face, when heaven broke through to earth, when a cord of indescribable joy was touched within him, when he felt clearly the love of God. This was the moment. The assurance Jesus got gave him strength to face the grim future. Memories of the event sustained Jesus through the passion. You know, I keep talking about encounter here. And each time we celebrate this uh, transfiguration story, the, 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 the need for an encounter. You see, when Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights with God on, on Mount Sinai, Moses had an experience that all the idiocy of the people who began to worship idols, was he part of them? He couldn't be. Why? why? Why could Moses not be part of them? Because of the experience he has had. He has had an experience. Abraham has had an experience. And with that experience, even though God asked of him something that was very difficult, he couldn't say no to God. Because he had an intimate relationship with God. I mean, the experience of God, and I keep saying, if your relationship with God in Christ is then say, then say, my people say, Aka Kaviza is Aka Kaviriche. Gregory is there, don't worry. <laughs> my people say, then say, then say, 
if it be true. Then say, then say, if it be lie. Right? But if you, if you had the experience yourself, even if they want to kill you for saying it, you will say, I experienced this. It's not then say, then say. Unfortunately for many of us, our Christian faith is still a matter of then say, then say. And I keep praying and I keep uh, talking about it. Let's keep praying for an encounter with the Lord so that our relationship with Christ will not be a matter of then say, then say. So that the kind of memory, the kind of experience, memories of which can sustain us through the most agonizing, traumatic kind of experience. The transfiguration experience came at a very difficult time for Jesus. A time of uncertainty, loneliness, and fear. On that mountain, he was affirmed by Moses and Elijah. And you know what the Israelites, what the Jews thought of Moses and Elijah? They were the great ancestors. Chief of prefects of all the ancestors. He was comforted by the voice of the father. He knew the father was with him. He knew he enjoyed the father's favor. Now, the fact that the father is with you, please, Nigerian Christians, take it seriously. The, the fact that the father is with you does not mean that you will not face adversity. Una de here. Because the problem in this country, which is why people are running away, running from one man of God to the other, one powerful man of God to the other, is that they think that if God is with them, they will not suffer any adversity. So if they are going to a church and they are suffering adversity, it means God is not in that church, they go to another. You get the point? That's the logic. But the stories of today, both first leading and, and, and the gospel, are telling us that God can be with you. And you still face adversity. Are Nigerian Christians hearing it? Not all adversity comes from the devil. Do you understand? Not all adversities come from the devil. Some of the adversities come directly from God. He knew he enjoyed God's favor. He was going to face the cross. But he knew nevertheless he enjoyed God's favor. He, so he could face any adversity for nothing could separate him from the love of God made visible in Christ. I beg, your big assignment today, apart from the, the, the passages you will read at the end, is to go and read that passage again. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 39. Inya, where is your Bible? Yes. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 39, New Jerusalem Bible. After saying this, what can we add? If God is for us, who can be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for the sake of all of us, then can we not expect that with him he will freely give us all his gifts? Who can bring any accusation against those that God has chosen? Who can bring any accusation against those that God has chosen? Next. When God grants saving justice, who can condemn? When God grants saving justice, who can condemn? Are we not sure that it is Christ Jesus who died? Yes, and more. Who was raised from the dead and is at God's right hand? And who is adding his plea for us? Can anything cut us off from the love of Christ? Can hardships... Now, he has started listening now. Can anything cut us off from the love of Christ? Meaning that if we believe that the love of Christ is the supreme thing, is the, is the, is the best thing we can ever have. So, can anything cut us off? Can, or yeah, he's listening. Can hardships or can distress... Hardships or distress... Or persecution... Or lack of food and clothing... Or threats or, or threats or violence. As scripture says, for your sake, we are being massacred all day long, treated as sheep to be slaughtered. No, we come through all these things triumphantly victorious by the power of him who loved us. By, the, gra by the grace of God, we shall come through this before we are condemned to eating cockroaches and lizards. We shall, we shall overcome this before we reach a victor's level of cockroaches and lizards. Amen. Amen. For I am certain of this. Now, that's, listen to that critical part. For I am certain. Can we all say, for I am certain? For I am certain. Neither death, 
nor life. Let's say it after her. Neither death nor life. Nor angels. Nor angels. Nor principalities. Nor principalities. Nothing already in existence. Nothing already in existence. And nothing still to come. And nothing still to come. Nor any power. Nor any power. Nor the heights. Nor the heights. Nor the depths. Nor the depths. Nor any created thing whatever. Nor any created thing whatever. Will be able to come between us. Will be able to come between us. And the love of God. And the love of God. Known to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord. Us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Great. For the disciples, the transfiguration was a major revelation and inspiration. The event for the disciples meant, was meant to reveal the true glory of Christ to them, to confirm the course Jesus had taken as correct, and to strengthen them for the scandal of the cross. Their fragile faith in Jesus will soon be tested. Well, when the our guy is taken, I mean, they will dispose, they will run away. Their fragile faith will soon be tested. Before then, the transfiguration revealed to them that Jesus is both the glorious Son of God and the suffering servant. Their fragile faith in Jesus will be tried. Then they will see this. With the transfiguration, they got a glimpse of the glory of the risen Lord. They saw themselves reflected in the image of Jesus' transformed self. Yes, the transfiguration event is filled with light and hope, foreshadowing the light and hope of the resurrection. History must, however, take its course. And sometimes history is delaying. <laughs> right? We know that glory is ours. We know that victory is ours. But sometimes history is delaying. And belief in God, the fact that we believe in God, does not offer escape from history and its harsh dimensions. But I think you people used to say that liberation of a people is not a 100 meter dash. It's a long distance race. It's a marathon. Not a 100 meter dash. Unfortunately, we have been doing a series of 100 meter dashes. And that's why it is because of the series of 100 meter dash that some people will join one political party today, they didn't win election, they will join the next one the next day, they didn't win election, they shift to the party in power, and that is why we don't have, we have not built a, a structure, political party um, a culture, that will remain with their ideology. So, we pray that everyone that is truly committed to liberating Nigeria will recognize that it is a marathon. And may the Lord give us all we require for a marathon. Amen. What does Usain Bolt, his own is mar it's a dash. Uh, who is that Ethiopian that is a marathon? Uh -huh. So may the Lord give us that one for long distance so that we can run 10 miles and 20 miles. Because the way it is now. Like Jesus on the way to Jerusalem, life for many of us could sometimes be hard, isn't it? We could be faced with poverty and unemployment, sickness and disease, failure in career or business, loneliness and rejection, insecurity and widespread violence, humiliation and condemnation, problem marriage, challenge children, or inability to find a suitable spouse. What kind of attitude do we adopt when faced with suffering and adversities? That's the problem. I was speaking to a group of, of, of people yesterday, and I had these ladies, Christian mothers, GWO, ladies of this, that. And I was saying to them, me, I know that as you people are doing Christian faith, Christian mother, Christian, that if any of you has a 38 year old daughter who is not married, you will go from one man of God to the other. True or false? And if you go from one man of God to the other and the thing doesn't come, you will go to Kijashrine. 
I said, this is my problem. This is my problem. That, and I that said, the Christian faith for many of us is only on the level of the skin. If you, if you scratch the skin, the blood flowing in there is African traditional religion. Which is, about, which is about this world and the benefits of this world. Or, not God, but the benefits of God. And that's why we keep running from one place to the other. May the Lord help us to understand the logic of the cross. That, that's the real issue. When people either don't understand or they reject the logic of the cross, it's actually a very tortuous life. It's a very, it's a very sad life many people are living. If, especially when you say you're a Christian. When you say you're a Christian and you reject the logic of the cross, oh, what a pity. You can't, you can't live a fulfilled life. You can't be fulfilled. At such times, do we know how to go up to the mountain? Do we know how to pray? The mountain can be in your room, so don't go and say, Father George, say we should go to, okay? Uh-huh. Only okay. Uh-huh. The mountain can be in your room. Do we know how to pray, how to reflect, how to receive the light of hope, how to seek the face of God and be reassured? Any person of faith who really takes time to seek God's face will come off from looking at God's face comforted, consoled. Any person of faith who really seeks, the, who is in adversity and seeks the face of God in all sincerity, you will come off feeling comforted and consoled. You will find time to listen, to hear those consoling words. You are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. I have you in the palm of my hands, so you will not be worsted. Amen? Amen. Help me tell your neighbor. Help me give those words to your neighbor. You are my beloved, if it's son or daughter. You will not be worsted in Jesus' name. At times of adversity, do you know how to connect with God who has a purpose for your life and who gives meaning to everything that happens to you? Do you know how to connect with God? You know that it is at times of adversity that you really know a Christian. Not when people are doing Thanksgiving. Eh? Your daughter got wedded yesterday and then you come and do Thanksgiving. Praise the Lord. Oh, sing, oh, sing, oh. Praise the Lord. Well, that is easy. People of faith are known as to how they respond in times of adversity. And I have constantly quoted here from Viktor Frankl, the, 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 the founder of logotherapy, the, the uh, Austrian uh, psychiatrist, who says that in the midst of intense suffering, and he was speaking from experience because he was in the Auschwitz, uh, he was in the Nazi concentration camp. Uh, in the midst of intense suffering, you always have a choice. So people who come and say, well, I had no choice. I had no choice but to go to Babalao. You had a choice, my friend. <laughs> I had no choice but to run from one man of God to the other. You had a choice. You have a choice. He says, look, you have, may have no choice in the kind of suffering that comes your way, but you have a choice in how you respond. You always choose your response. God forbid that you should be in a circumstance that you have no choice. You always have a choice. You choose your response. He says that is where the core of humanity is. What makes a real grown-up human being is how you respond to suffering. A really grown-up, mature human being is determined by how you respond in the face of... And this is where... I see that we lack a lot in our society. How do you respond in the face of, of suffering? It is through suffering that human beings are formed. Suffering becomes the fire that refines gold. You know, I keep saying to you that, you know, we were brought into this world to grow, right? We were sent into this world to grow. Now, we grow through learning. Didn't I say that? We learn best through suffering. We were sent into this world to grow. We grow through learning. We learn best through suffering. My prayer and hope is that the suffering of Nigerians at this time 
she will help us to grow out of idiocy. Amen? Amen. May our suffering bring benefit, meaning help us to grow out of our traditional age-long idiocy. So that those of us who are suffering together may come and look at one another's face and recognize a brother and a sister. May our suffering in the face of, uh, may our, our response in the face of suffering be Christian responses. Now, come go with me. Come go with me to the mountain top where the present glimpses on the future and the already gazes on the not yet. Come go with me to the heights where the cross beholds the crown and, mortar, and the mortar kisses the eternal. Come go with me to the hill crest where the ground is decked with truth and the earthly is inducted into the heavenly. Come go with me to the highlands where humanity is momentarily transformed into divinity and the flesh is dazzled by luminosity itself. Come go with me to Mount Tabor where frightened men are enthused and anxious hearts are consoled. Yes, come go with me to the mountain of God where ancient men give witness to the ancient of days and you and I shall be transfigured into his image. Yes, come go with me. Scripture passages on significant encounters, mountain encounters. You see, the mountain is very, very important in our religion. And there were places where there was a lot of encounters. And let's just, just give you a few here. Mount Horeb. That is where God first appeared to who? Moses. Moses, I mean, Exodus chapter 3. Also, Mount Horeb, the same one that Elijah encountered God, you remember that passage when he was running away from Ahab, right? He was running away from King Ahab, and then he encountered God where the angel brought him food, and then he had energy to continue. Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19, where the commandments were given. Now, Mount Carmel, many of my people like that one, where Elijah Worsted the 450 prophets of Baal. Then the Mount of Temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. Where the devil tempted Jesus after 40 days of fast and so on. Then the Mount of the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. Then Mount Tabor that we read about today. Matthew 17, 1 to 7. Then the Mount of Calvary where Jesus was crucified. And then the Mount of Olives where Jesus ascended uh, to heaven when he was leaving this place. This is my son, my only son. Listen to him and you will live. This is my son, my only son. Listen to him and you will live. His name is Jesus, Emmanuel. He is the Savior of mankind. This is my son, my only son. Listen to him. His name of peace. Of God, the promised one. This is my son, my only son. He came from heaven that we may listen. He died for us that we may live. This is my son. My only son, listen to him and you will live. All who labor and are burdened, 
Come on to him and find your rest. This is my soul. My only son, listen to him and you will live. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your holy name for your many blessings. Thank you for the readings of today, the sacrifice of Isaac, the transfiguration of Jesus on Mount Tabor, and the words of St. Paul that assure us that you love us immensely and that nothing can separate us from your love. And that we can keep going on because of the confidence we have in your love. May your name be praised forever. Lord, help us Christians to hold on fast to this love of yours and the assurance of ultimate victory so that we may continue our struggle through this life, particularly in our country, our struggle for a better society, our struggle from liberation, for liberation, our struggle to rid our land of idiocy and irresponsible leadership and inept leadership, our struggle to have good governance and good citizens. Lord, grant us hope. Give us the encouragement we need. In this difficult time, give us the consolation and comfort we require. And see us through the dark tunnel of today to a land of promise. Through Christ our Lord.